here's the problem. I became a teacher, and I, I, he was led me right to it. That was the Holy Grail. Learn to make the reed from the crow. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was as big a lesson as anyone ever taught me. So uh, they were both great masters, those two men, and I am incredibly great. I, I, I am more grateful as every year goes by for those men, and I, I wish they were still here to knock some sense into this younger generation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, I just love those stories about our legends in the oboe world. We, no. we well, they them. earned they earned those legends. They had an incredibly strong work ethic, both of them. <laughs> we have some more questions for you yes. pertaining to more philosophical issues of reed making. And the first question I have for you in that... To read realm... or not to read? <laughs> oh. Or how about this? Your dream read. How would you describe your dream read? My dream read. You know, Courtney, you probably know John Mack. Wasn't the great read of 83 or something like that? He He did. He did. I think some people have fish stories. He had read stories. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. But I can't. I remember what it is that distinguished that read to him. It was something about the way he'd made the plateau. He'd made the plateau more all, all one sort of thickness throughout. Mm-hmm. But um, I can't remember what year it was. Delancey's great fish story, Reed story, was uh, as he was playing that last month, he played his skulls. Mm-hmm. And he sounded like a million bucks. Now, he was only 55. He was determined not to be an old oboe player. I have not avoided that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he turned to me. And uh, he played the skulls, and he said, well, my boy, I want you to tell them that when I hung it up, I could still do it. Mm-hmm. So, of course, I make a point of telling everybody that. He was absolutely the peak of his form. And so, he, and so he said to me, would you like to try that read? Well, there were two things about that moment. One is he played a very light, very closed read. And I have peers who were students of his as well, who themselves play very light reads. And I said, you know, I couldn't get a sound out of it. That was, was, that was the way it was with Mark Lipschitz's reads. I sat next to Mark for a season. Well, he played very open on those reads. But the bigger point is, would you like to hear about that read? And I said, well, it sounds like you, you just made it. He says, well, it's seven years old. Oh. I said, well, so he said, let me tell you about that. He said, years ago, the Philadelphia Woodwind Quintet was on tour, and they were in Ankara, Turkey. I, by the way, just played in Turkey a little more than a year ago on a chamber players tour. Fascinating mm-hmm. country. Anyway, he was running for a plane, I think, or train. I think a plane, he said. And an old man who could hardly speak a word of English came up and thrust a bundle of, you know, a dozen 20 tubes of cane under his arm. And he was just able to communicate that he appreciated the concert and hear it. Well, Delancey went home, and he put that bundle of cane on his desk, and it sat there for months. And he said to himself, oh, what the heck? (laughs) And lo and behold, there was not one splinter of that cane that didn't yield wreath. He said, strong as steel, smooth as silk. They lasted forever, concertos and... (sighs) Now, you know, he played nothing but fresh reeds, so this was really unusual for him. I I keep reeds around. I play a slightly heavier reed, and I'll use them, you know, they may may peak out, you know, two or three uh, different tanglewood seasons, you know, if I really preserve them. Well, this is very unusual for him. So he said, I had an uncle who was in the State Department. They looked all over the Eastern Mediterranean looking for crates, and (laughs) no, none to be found. So that's his. That was his big fish story. My fish story is just that, you know, I took all those auditions. I famously took, how many was it, 73, 72? No, it was was 22, 23 auditions, actually. I, I, I say that because people come up to me and say, well, was it, you know, 130 auditions you took? <laughs> no, it, was, it was actually we'll make it was sure 22, that keeps growing. but it, 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 it was a long, it was a we'll long, arduous, a, lar, a long arduous uh, pro, pro, process. And 
I indeed, when I won my first job in the San Francisco Symphony, it really was the best read I had ever made. And I could just look at it and it could do anything I wanted it to do. And by gum, that was the read that won me my first audition. And then I put it away immediately. <laughs> and six months later, I won the job at the Met on that same read. Now, And you know, I felt so guilty about that. I mean, I really felt I didn't let anybody know that for like 10 years that I'd done that. And then, so I've got that sitting in my desk over here. The, oh, the great read of 85. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, uh, in that case, let me see. I've got. Uh, I've also got the read that I won my uh, Boston Symphony audition playing. Except that that one it wasn't that it was a magic read. It was a very good read, but that was the one that I won my Boston Symphony audition on. So anyway, those are my two best reads, and they're sitting in my desk, and I take them out and look at them occasionally, fondly. <laughs> You know, it was interesting, though. I watched uh, Delancey, particularly because I sat on the section with him. And occasionally he'd say, now, which one of these sounds best to you? And I remember one time, it was for Shostakovich 5, and he said, what do you think? And so I said, well, that one has a nice compaction of sound. This one has a nice texture. And so he played it, and he said, he played that solo incredibly well. And uh, I said, so... I bet that wasn't the one I picked. He says, no, it wasn't. And it goes to show you can't trust anyone. And he said, <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> he said it with a smile on his face. He can be very, very tough, by the way. Yeah. How right. far in advance do you make reads for recording sessions or orchestra concerts? Are these things that you make in advance or the day of? Or what's your habit for these? Well, I do make a slightly heavier read. Not as heavy as that. I mean, John Max says, what, is these, what are these heavy reads of yours I hear about? And he played them and said, well, that's not that heavy. I play a very wide range of reads. And my belief is a read wants to be a light read or wants to be a heavy read. You make the read that that piece of cane wants to become, so to speak. So I don't make reads for a particular event. I think, in fact, you're in danger of ruining reads you know, this is a read, but I can't play the Mozart concerto on it. So that, that, you know, well, keep making reads until you finally can play the Mozart and play the Mozart on that one. So I always have a wide range, wide array of reads. I don't make reads for recordings. Most of my recording, you know, I mean, when I'm recording for the chamber players, then those are recordings, pure recordings, like the old fashioned recordings. But most of what I do, you know, is for live performance. So mm -hmm. I, I, I make the same reads that I always do, but I make sure I have a very wide range. And it would be very unusual for me not to use three or four different mm -hmm. reads in a concert. I might have one movement where I need a very light read for a, a sustained, quiet solos in a slow movement and need something very robust and something I can lay it out there in a Mahler uh, outer movement. You know, it, I, I, I just use an incredible number of different reads. I get teased about that because <laughs> so you look at my stand and I might have nine or ten reads on my stand. Delancey, however, did ad admonish, always have a backup read, but that's no problem for me. I've always got a very large number. Do you have any favorite read tests? Read tests. So here's the thing about read tests. And I think this is going to sound funny. It comes out as a joke, but it's not a joke. When I was a kid, I was looking for read tests. I mean, it worked, you know, and it just was much, there was much less sense of organization about it. And then as I matured, particularly in my years at the Met, there I began to accrue tests. The, the important thing I say to young players, particularly from some studios that I'm very familiar with, the purpose of a test is not to prove that what you're scraping on is not going to work. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a funny way of putting it, but yeah. I know people that amass so many tests and I watch them at work. You know, you remember what John Max saying was, he said, I never take no for an answer from an inanimate object. <laughs> yeah. But true, there are true. people that have so many tests that you can see, oh no, it's not doing this, and it's not doing that. It should tweedle, and it's traveling, and it should do this, and not that. You know, you find a dysfunction in the read, 
It's as if a doctor walked down the street and grabbed somebody and says, I can't make this joke in the age of COVID, but generally doctors <laughs> wait for the patient to come to them and they say, doctor, I feel poorly. And they say, well, what do you feel like? They said, well, this is happening. They said, well, let me test you, you know. So don't get the, the cart before the horse, in other words. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe very strongly in crows. In, in, at this stage of the game, they're like people that use 15 different reed crows. I do two reed crows. One is to see with a very full, you know, I blow low into the reed to see if there's any looseness or noise or rattle in it. And the second test I do is to make sure that the upper crow slides into the lower crow. I don't find that I need any more crow tests than that. And I think the, the problem is you can so paralyze yourself with tests that you really talk yourself out of making reads. Um, by the way, there's another really important one that I learned from Linda Stroman when she was sitting next to me at the mat, and that's the plaque test. And that's a really important test. And by the way, I resisted it. I said, well, maybe <laughs> if one side passes the plaque test, that's, that's when you put the plaque in the reed, close the reed on it, and the tip should close symmetrically on the plaque. That's very important. And really, by the time your reed is about 80% made, it should be able to pass it. It's very often a test of whether you've got a good gouge, although you can encourage with your scrape something that's not. But that's another test that's very important. Mm -hmm. Those two crow tests and the plaque test are the most important ones I have. There are measurements that I really believe. I, you know, I told you the, the length I usually make my reads to, and there are measurements to do with gouge that I stick to pretty closely. Could you describe for us how you take a read from a blank to a finished read? I, I think I can put it pretty succinctly. There are two very broad ways in which you approach the making of a read. Mm -hmm. The first is just what sort of a model you have for it. And it, it's so obvious that people don't think about it, but your first model should be a visual model. You know how thin the tip is. You know how long it should be. You know um, how it should be proportioned. And a read that doesn't look right usually doesn't sound right. So your first model is a visual model. Your second model is that of the feel of the read, which means to say the crow, right? And the very last thing you look at is how it sounds. Now, oboists always get this turned around. They usually are trying to make things sound right. And that usually means that they, they create a read that's not particularly well balanced. Now, the second way you look at this is in terms of the function of a read. And again, there's sort of three steps of that. Now, it's funny, 35 years ago, I'd ask a group of young players, what's the first thing you look for? And this has become very standardized now, interestingly. So the first thing you look for, everybody knows, look for response. Okay, now response, of course, can come from all the areas of the read, but the primary area of response is from the tip. People know that. The second thing you look for is pitch. Pitch, and that means not just whether it plays 440, 441, whatever. You're looking for how it holds that pitch. And then again, the last thing you worry about is the sound. If you do the first two things, the last thing usually comes. And by the way, that also means there are three areas of the reed, the tip, the heart, and the back. The primary responsibility of the tip is response. The tip and the, and the heart together are responsible for the pitch of the reed and the stability of the reed. And sound quality is enhanced by the back. So I, I was taught uh, early in, in my years at Curtis, make the reed from the tip back. So I actually make a reed that if I were to cover up the back of the reed, about five to 10 minutes into my scraping of the reed, it looks finished and only then do I add the back? So I think it's really important to establish the thinness of the tip and establish the relationship between the tip and the heart and only then add the back. 
That has worked very beautifully for me and it was taught to me by 